Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. No matter how much you love and try to protect your child from the evils within this world, evil can unfortunately still penetrate the mind and make that same child that you love so dearly do the unimaginable. This is the story of Kwame Wilson. Before we get any further into this video, welcome to my channel. I am Courtney Elise, aka Court Crimes TV, and if you happen to enjoy, please like, subscribe, and comment. Let's get into the video. Kwame Wilson was born in 1990 in Chicago, Illinois, to parents Yolanda Holmes and Jeffrey Todd Wilson. Kwame was an only child and was mainly raised by his mother Yolanda because his father, Jeffrey, was sentenced to life in prison in 1993. Jeffrey was a well-reputed gang leader from the west side of Chicago. In 1993, Jeffrey was charged with an aggravated arson after burning down a house where two people were killed. Losing the father of her only child to the street slash penitentiary, Yolanda made sure that her son, Kwame, was her first and main priority. She made sure that her son wanted for nothing. She wanted to shield her son from the dangerous street life that took his father away from him. Yolanda was a popular and very successful hairstylist and owned the very successful hair salon, Nappy Heads Salon. Yolanda was loved by everyone and she loved everyone. She was known for having a huge heart a very caring person and constantly giving back to her community. You know, she was known for giving back to school drives and giving out backpacks, just everything. Everyone loved her for how good of a person she was genuinely. Yolanda was also known for the immense amount of love that she had for her only child, Kwame. She loved and adored everything about her son Kwame. She gave him the world. She made sure he was living good while she was on this earth and she made sure that he was set whenever she was not on this earth anymore. Since Kwame was an only child, Kwame was the sole beneficiary to all of Yolanda's assets and to life insurance policies. Now you know what's sad is that most inner city families, you know parents, usually don't have things set up for their child if something horrible was to happen to the parent. Normally the child is unfortunately left on their own with nothing. But Yolanda Holmes made sure that her son was straight. Now Kwame, on the other hand, was nothing like his mother. You know, Kwame was brought up, you could say privileged, because his mother was very successful. She owned a very successful hair salon. And Kwame was known to be very spoiled, very entitled, and only cared about himself. People described him as a spoiled brat and that he knew he could get whatever he wanted. And if if that didn't happen his way, he would act out. Now it's said that Kwame used to constantly brag about his mother's money. You know, he used to always tell people that we got money, you know, I got money, this and that. Like he just used to always brag about his mother's hard earned money. Even though Yolanda gave Kwame everything he could possibly want, she still wanted her son to go out and get it on his own. Because she did that, that's how she became successful. She went out and did it on her own and she wanted the same for her son. But Kwame, on the other hand, was an aspiring rapper. You know, Kwame wanted the luxury lifestyle and he wanted it fast. He didn't want to work a regular nine to five job making slow money. He wanted this money right then and there. On the morning of September 2nd, 2012, police arrived to the homes of Yolanda Holmes after her boyfriend, Curtis Wyatt, called 911. When police arrived to Yolanda's luxury upscale apartment, they would find Yolanda to death. Her boyfriend, Curtis, was obviously alive, but he was kind of disoriented, but he was found with cuts and lacerations to the face and head. When searching through the home, police would find a broken handgun and a knife that was missing from the kitchen block on the bedroom floor. There was such an intense struggle to survive that there was blood everywhere throughout the house. There was blood on the walls, on the floor, everywhere. Chicago detectives stated that this was an overkill for someone to stab and 
this woman numerous times. Whoever set out to Yolanda, they wanted to make sure she was definitely dead. Later on that morning, Kwame would end up arriving to his mother's apartment and the police would tell him right then and there that his mother had been killed. After being told the news of his mother's death, Kwame instantly breaks down crying. I mean, being told that your mother was murdered in the way she was murdered, I would break down crying too. That's a horrible way to be killed. After talking to Kwame, police then turn their attention back to Curtis who is being treated by paramedics, you know, because he had all the cuts and bruises from what occurred that morning. He told police that he and Yolanda recently started seeing one another again and that he had initially woke up because he heard Yolanda on the phone with someone. Then the next thing he remembers is hearing he said he tried to get up and fight with the man, but that's how he ended up with the injuries and being knocked unconscious, and that's how the man ended up getting away. Detectives started to become suspicious of Curtis because Curtis said that while being, you know, disoriented and having cuts all over his face and his girlfriend is now dead, he said that he tried to clean up the crime scene. Detectives also found out that Curtis did have some violent altercations with Yolanda within their on and off relationship. My question is, you see everything that just happened. Your girlfriend is lying on the floor, I'm pretty sure in a pool of blood. She's obviously deceased. Why would your first response to this be to clean up everything, to try to clean up everything? It doesn't make any sense. Why didn't you just call the police right away? I digress. When talking to Kwame, Kwame wasn't aware that his mother's relationship with Curtis was back on. He told detectives that he believed Curtis was the one who committed the murder because like I said, it was known that he was very violent towards Yolanda. Detectives started to go through the building to see if anyone heard or saw anything suspicious that morning. But unfortunately, no one saw anything. Detectives then decide to go check out the security cameras, which I think they should have started out with that before, to see if they can see anything suspicious. While looking through surveillance, they notice something strange. The footage shows a man at 4.32 a.m. approach the entrance of the building, punch in a code, and enter the building. He was wearing a hoodie, carrying a detergent bottle, and clothes on a hanger. At 4.46 a.m., that same man was seen leaving the building but this time he was in a different hoodie. Detectives notice that as he's leaving, he passes by a man later identified as a resident of that building. That person was later contacted and questioned, but he had nothing to do with the crime. Detectives then put their attention back on Curtis because they just can't shake the feeling as to why he was left alive. This was an extremely brutal murder. And you would think someone who's and someone when they see another witness within the you know murder scene they would shoot him as well they would try to get rid of him as well because they don't want any witnesses left but Curtis was left you know with stab wounds obviously but he was left alive something wasn't adding up with this whole situation Curtis agreed to a polygraph test which came back deceptive but they couldn't pin the murder on him because they don't have definite proof that he was the one who did it they just know that he was there there was evidence that Yolanda's blood was only confined to the bedroom while Curtis's blood was everywhere else within the house. Due to the blood not being in the same place like Yolanda's blood was in the bedroom and Curtis's blood was like in the hallway, living room, wherever else, this lessened the odds of the altercation being between Curtis and Yolanda. So now that Curtis is kind of in the clear, they start to put their attention back on the surveillance. They noticed that the man who was entering the building at that time was wearing headphones. And one of the pieces of evidence found at the crime scene was a broken headphone cord. Fast forward a week after Yolanda's murder, her funeral is being held. People start to take notice of Kwame's bizarre behavior. He's not really acting like a grieving child who just lost his mother to a brutal murder. I get people grieve differently. You know, some people it takes a while for them to really come to terms with a certain person never being there again for them. But according to the people in attendance at Yolanda's funeral, Kwame just had 
no emotion. They said he didn't shed not one tear. They said he would get up and leave out of the building. They said he would sit way at the back of the church or funeral home. They said he was trying to stop other people from crying. You know, they said he didn't even get up to see his mother in the casket. Shortly after the funeral, this is when Kwame started to really floss a whole bunch of money all over Instagram. He started to show fans of money and hold bricks of money to his ear. And people started to question where he was getting this money from, but they just kept it to themselves. You know, Kwame, like I said, wanted to be a rapper. And he, with all this newfound wealth, he started to show off his new foreign cars and his expensive jewelry and designer clothes. And like I said, people questioned it, but they kept it to themselves. They just didn't know where he was getting all this money from. He also spoke at a very highly publicized funeral for a young girl by the name of Hadia Pendleton. Kwame Wilson lost his mother to gun violence on November 14th. My mother, she was a neighborhood woman. Um, a guy entered her home, you know, and, and murdered her, you know, just to steal. Many he spoke at her funeral to speak out against violence because obviously his mother passed away due to violence. Weeks turn into months and months turn into a year when police finally get the phone records of Yolanda on that fateful night. Because like I said, Curtis said that he woke up because he initially heard Yolanda on the phone with someone that morning. Detectives realized that Yolanda had two phones. They say that they saw one of the phones had a lot of activity before, during, and after the murder occurred. And once everything was over, all activity stopped on that second phone. They then tried to contact Kwame about this second phone and see who she was possibly trying to contact that night of the murder, but they couldn't get in contact with him. They then come to quick realization that Kwame actually gave police that second phone number that was registered under Yolanda. Detectives, now 13 months into the investigation realized that Kwame was the one on that second phone before, during, and after the murder. They find out that the man he was actually talking to was a man by the name of Eugene Spencer. Once finding this out, detectives issued an investigative alert for Kwame and Eugene Spencer. They finally get in touch with Kwame, which ironically, he said he had been trying to get in touch with them. Weird. During this whole investigation, police are taking notice to how Kwame is flashing this money, throwing money to his fans and You feel me, man? I don't play no games. You feel me? I don't play no games, man. You know, I do this for real, bro. I don't got no problem with giving back, man. I'm the only one out here with a show that's actually giving back, you feel me? And I got proof for sure, you feel me? Shout out to this fan I'm finna go slide on, man. I'm finna take care of you. but they keep it to themselves. You know, they don't want to let it be known that they're suspicious of Kwame's activities. When talking to Kwame about this second phone, police let it be known that they find it suspicious that Kwame was using this second phone during the morning of his mother's 
murder. He even admitted that it was indeed his mother's phone and that he was using it that morning. He also admitted to knowing who Eugene Spencer was and also identified him as the person entering his mother's apartment the night of her murder. Kwame then told police that Eugene was supposed to go into his mother's apartment to only do a robbery. Due to this confession from Kwame, police bring in Eugene for questioning. Once brought in for questioning, they ask Eugene if he's ever been in Yolanda's apartment. And he said, I went inside and some guy tried to kill me. So immediately, Eugene starts to crack under pressure, which is a good thing. Detectives start to realize that no one knew that Curtis, Yolanda's boyfriend, was going to be there. Eugene admitted that he got access to Yolanda's home from no one other than Kwame Wilson. He said that he went into Yolanda's home to sh and st Yolanda and that he fought with Curtis knocking him unconscious. He was hired to murder Yolanda Holmes, Kwame's mother. Detectives come to a conclusion that it was Kwame on the phone with his mother 40 minutes before her murder. He told his mother that he was coming over so she stayed up waiting for her child. Detectives determined that Kwame was the one who gave Eugene the detergent bottle, the hoodie, and clothes on the hanger to make it look like he lived within the building. And they also learned that Kwame was the one who supplied the to Eugene to murder his own mother. They also learned that Kwame's ex-girlfriend, Loriana Johnson, was the getaway driver. Kwame was on the phone with Eugene while the murder was happening. Kwame, Yolanda's only son, the one that she gave the world to, the one that she loved so dearly, told Eugene, and I quote, please excuse my language, he told Eugene on the phone as he was murdering his mother, make sure that is dead. This explains the overkill. This explains the you know, I get so emotional because some people don't appreciate their parents while they're here. And for him to do this to this woman who was loved by everyone is so evil. Kwame offered Eugene $4,200 to murder his mother. Once everything was done, Eugene only received $70. Meanwhile, like I said before, Kwame is flashing all his jewelry, all his money, all his mom's money. After the funeral, Kwame withdrew $90,000 from his mother's account. He emptied his mother's account and this is when he started to flash everything online, tearing up $100 bills. This was wrong. This was blood money. I don't understand how you can do this to your mother. To anyone. You know, it's said that Kwame was into acting. You know, he had his own web series called Nick Story. He was an aspiring rapper. He was in pictures with, you know, Fredo Santana. Rest in peace to him. You know, he was in pictures with all these people. And I'm pretty sure his mother would have supported him through thick and thin. And helped elevate him to be better. But he didn't care about his mother. On December 20. 24th of 2013, Kwame was arrested for orchestrating the murder of his own mother. In January of 2020, Kwame was sentenced to 99 years in prison. He is never getting out. He is in jail with his no good daddy. Once being sentenced, Kwame had the audacity to make a statement. He said, and I quote, I just want to say, nobody loved my mother more than me. She was all I had. That's it. Yeah, Kwame, you know, that was pure love, you know, by orchestrating your mother's murder and telling the murderer to make sure that is dead. That being your mother who loved you unconditionally, who would have supported your acting career, who would have supported your music career. That's pure love, you know, murdering your mother for her money. Eugene Spencer was also sentenced to 100 years in prison and Loriana Johnson pleaded guilty to robbery and served seven years before being released on parole. 
This is called matricide, when a child kills their parent. Guamain was such an ungrateful child that he was willing to do the unthinkable just for $90,000, just to flex online for people you don't even know. Even Lil Reese from Chicago made a statement on Twitter saying, you're supposed to kill for your OG, not killer, which is true. Rest in peace, Yolanda. I'm sorry that your child, the one you love so much, did this to you. Rest in peace. I've seen nothing negative online about you. All positive on her Facebook page. Rest in peace, Yolanda.